This is part one of Romeca Corporation's two-part tutorial on how to design a hopper feeder conveyor drive. This lecture will be presented in three parts. The purposes of hoppers, standard conveyor belt loads, and special hopper loading. A separate video will be presented in three parts in which arching theory, calculating hopper drag load, and pressure relief tips will be presented. What are the four purposes of hoppers? Material storage, material blending, the reception of batch loading, and material metering. Here's an example of material storage. In this example, a pulping plant stores wood chips in three separate bins. Each bin is loaded by a standard belt conveyor. The material is taken away from the hoppers using a drag chain conveyor, moving the chips into the pulping plant for production. Here we see several silos used at an iron ore mine in Minnesota. The silos store the taconite ore. They are loaded by a standard troughing belt conveyor at the top. And down below, you can see the close-up of a typical drawdown point. Material is removed from the silo through the drawdown point and taken away continuously by a troughing belt conveyor. Here's an example of hoppers used for material blending. This shows a five pant leg configuration in which each pant leg contains a different ingredient. For example, a large gravel, a smaller size of gravel, sand, and so forth. Each pant leg has a hopper feeder conveyor at the bottom of it. You can see that each hopper feeder conveyor has a drive and the main collecting conveyor has a conveyor drive. This is an example where a hopper is used to be an interface between batch and continuous. Here we see a clamshell shift unloader removing coal in batches, one clamshell load at a time. The material is deposited into the hopper, which accumulates the material and continuously feeds it onto the dock conveyor. Here's an example of a rotary rail car dumper. Rail cars are dumped one at a time, and the material is deposited into a, con a hopper, and a typical hopper feeder conveyor is beneath. Here we see a front end loader moving stone into a hopper which then transfers the material continuously onto a belt conveyor. And finally, we see a variety of mine haul trucks waiting in line to dump their material into this hopper. The hopper then feeds material continuously to the takeaway belt. And finally, material metering. Both of these examples show that stone is stored and then removed from the hopper with a hopper feeder conveyor. In this instance, both of these conveyors are powered by VFDs and the VFDs are connected to an ultrasonic probe. The ultrasonic probe essentially looks down into the throat of the gyratory crusher and the feeder conveyor belt is either sped up or slowed down so as to keep the throat of the gyratory crusher choke fed. Now let's turn our attention to a trick question. In the example of continuous flow, if we have one continuously running conveyor feeding another continuously running conveyor, and the material is coming in at 1,000 tons per hour, and this conveyor belt has a speed of 100 feet per minute, what will be the output if this conveyor belt has a speed of 200 feet per minute? The answer is 1,000 tons per hour. 1,000 tons per hour in means 1,000 tons per hour out in a continuously running situation. A different belt speed simply means that the cross section of the material in the trough will be different here than here. But in a continuous flow, the belt speed will not affect the carrying rate. By the way, we are using imperial units in this short video. 
Now let's take a look at the trick question regarding belt speed when we consider flow from a metering hopper. Imagine that the amount of material in the hopper is unlimited and the output is unrestricted. In other words, the opening is big enough to let any amount come out. So if we have a hopper feeder conveyor with a belt speed of 100 feet per minute, moving material from the hopper at 1,000 tons per hour, the trick question is, what is the output if we speed the conveyor belt up to 200 feet per minute? The answer is 2,000 tons per hour because the handling rate is linearly proportional to the belt speed in this instance. Okay, let's turn our attention now to standard bulk conveyor belt loads in a continuous material flow situation. Notice that we have material coming in continuously into the feed chute and coming away from this belt conveyor out of this charge chute. The drawing highlights some of the key features of a typical conveyor belt. Drive pulley, troughing idlers, loading skirts, feed chute, tail pulley, return idlers, gravity take up in this example with two snub pulleys. We've not shown other items such as belt cleaners, slider beds and the like. But suffice it to say these are the main components to be considered when calculating effective belt tension. TE, effective belt tension, is essential to know in order to determine the amount of power required to move the conveyor belt. Examples of some of the components of TE are listed here. This is not all comprehensive, but it's an example of some of the components we need to consider. TAM, for example, is the belt tension required to continuously accelerate material that is fed onto the belt. In other words, what is the force required to overcome momentum? TB is the tension required to lift or lower the belt. TM is the tension required to lift or lower the conveyed material. In other words, these are the forces that are required to overcome gravity. Then we look at some components such as TBC, which is the tension required to overcome belt cleaner drag. TSB, the tension required to overcome skirt board drag. TX, the tension required to overcome carrying and return idler bearing and seal drag. And finally, in this example, TP, which is a tension required to overcome resistance of pulleys to rotate on their bearings, plus the resistance of the belt to flexure around those pulleys. The equation you see here is beyond the scope of this short presentation, but it's taken from the Equ Conveyor Equipment Manufacturers Association Belt Conveyor Design Manual. And it shows us how we can uh, calculate tension required to overcome gravity, friction, and momentum. Once we know the effect of belt tension in pounds, then we can calculate the power required to drive the belt. Required power equals the required belt pull times the belt speed. The equation is required power equals TE times V, where TE is in pounds and V, belt speed, is in feet per minute. So our answer comes out in a certain number of foot-pounds per minute. Since we know that one horsepower equals 33,000 foot-pounds per minute, the required power can be converted from foot-pounds per minute to horsepower and then a drive system can be selected. Now let's have a look at the special hopper load on a feeder belt conveyor. This is not a continuously flowing situation as was mentioned previously. We have essentially an unlimited amount of material in the bin which exerts a vertical force, also called live load, on the conveyor beneath it. It's, con it's exerting an extra force on the con conveyor above and beyond what we described previously. And material is flowing, as you can see, from left to right. When we put this additional vertical force on the feeder conveyor, that results in an extra 
horizontal force. The extra vertical force results in an extra horizontal force here against the sidewall of the hopper. Also, uh, this extra force can be called another component of belt drag. And we see that illustrated here. The belt drag must be calculated in order to be added to the effective belt tension for the conveyor as if it were a continuously flowing system. And we will show how to calculate this extra belt pull in part two of this tutorial. The next part we'll discuss arching theory, calculating hopper drag load and pressure relief tips. I hope you've enjoyed this short tutorial. For more conveyor drive design tips, go to RomecaCorp.com. Thank you very much.